Welcome to the Captain's Run with the great Cameron Smith. Smitty, I'm telling you right now, I woke up with a bit of a fever this morning. <laughs> I, I thought you were about to say something. How's he woke up with a... a <laughs> <laughs> morning glory with Matty Johns is tomorrow, mate. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, great mate, start. I woke up with a fever. I was shivering. I was yes. shivering. I was going, well, what? I don't... Mm-hmm. Do I feel under the weather or right. is finals footy around? And then I realised it's finals fever, baby. Ah, it's a finals fever. Yes, that's what it is. Yeah, have, you got the, have you got the same fever or is it just me? Yeah, no, I was, I was uh, dropping my kids off to school this morning and I'm thinking, geez, I feel a little bit like I'm a bit sweaty, <laughs> like my forehead's a bit hot. <laughs> and then I thought, and then I just realised my kids jammed up the heater. I was like, oh, no, no, I'm excited. No, I'm excited, mate. It's huge. It's... um. Huge weekend of footy. It's been said many times by many, many people about the matchups this week. Could not have asked for a first week matchup, um, little lineup of of matchups like we've got this weekend. Kicking off with Panthers and Para, Battle of the West. Oh my God! Seriously, it, 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 if you could like if you could at the start of the year go, these are the teams that I want to play each other in the first round. You could mm. not have picked a better week. But it's it's almost like rival round. Yeah, crazy. Isn't it? It's like it's rival round. So Battle of the West first up. Then you've got Canberra uh, v. The Storm, who have had a, a long-lasting rivalry. May have simmered over the last couple of years, but certainly I remember um, back in the early days when, when Craig first started coaching for that next sort of 10-year period, there was some pretty big battles between the two clubs. The Roosters and the Rabbitohs. Stop it. I don't know. Does it get bigger than that? No, certainly, it certainly not a, a, a such a long-standing rivalry like those two teams have. Like they've just been bitter rivals for over a century now. Um, and then you just, and then we got the Sharkies Cowboys. <laughs> and like, and the, the crazy, the good thing is, is that Sharkies Cowboys is they're the two Cinderella stories. So it yeah. couldn't be more perfect. Like the two teams where. You know, there's no way we would have seen them in the top four, no. and now they're gonna. One of them is gonna take the next step into a prelim if they get the win. Yeah, incredible. Well, they're, they're, they'll each, each of them will at least be there next week, um, and as you said, can be one will have the week off and they'll be into a prelim. So, fantastic for both organisations, especially I, I feel the Cowboys. Like they they were a club that many people were saying, "Well, wooden spooners." Uh, for 2022, but um, you know they've done a fantastic job to get themselves in the position they're in. Wonderful opportunity, I feel, for them to, to travel down to Sydney and just. The, I feel they need to just put an emphasis on the reward for getting a victory this week against the Sharks. Like it's huge. Think about this: if they if they go down there and, and get a win, they get a week off, and they then they're playing a prelim in Townsville, oh. Ta- like. They're forcing someone to fly to Townsville to to play in front of a, a capacity crowd of North Queenslanders. There'll be whoever they play. There'll be there'll be very little of their supporters there. It'll be eighty five percent Cowboy supporters to try and get into a grand final. Like it's just such a a huge opportunity for them. And you know what I loved about their performance on the weekend is I feel like they're recognizing that opportunity because. What did we say before last week's game with the Cowboys? We said, what matters is completion rate, the small little things that you can control. And yes, they were playing at Penrith Panthers. It's reserve grade. Mm. But guess what their completion rate was after like 50 minutes? It was like 90% or something. Yep. Um, So really, really good signs for the Cowboys. But huge week of news. It honestly... It it never ceases to amaze me. The I just every year I feel like it's yeah, keeping us in, like, it's keeping us in a job campy. Honestly, it really is. It really is. Uh, so huge news. And what's just really surprising about this is I really didn't feel like you know the broader audience of rugby league were calling for but swift action against Taylor and May. But anyway, we'll we'll get to it. So essentially, Taylor and May was found guilty uh, of assault, right, reportedly. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, there's a video of him pulling a, a gentleman a gentleman to the ground uh, after that gentleman approached Nathan Cleary and basically just standing over the gentleman uh, on the ground. And the NRL have come out and given him two-week suspension, but that two-week suspension, it's not this week, it's next week. And I think that that is what has shocked the fans so much is that I don't think we've ever seen something similar or I personally can't remember. Maybe there has been a time. But we've actually got Vlandy's response into, I guess, the fans' uh, questions as to why something like this would happen around finals footy. 
we will consider the fans. A lot of ex-players look at it through the players' lens. We look at we look at it now through everyone's lens. And and the most important person at the moment is the fan. Why penalise the Penrith fans of an indiscretion that the player did? The person that should be paying the penalty is the player, and they will because they've got two matches and a substantial part of their salary. So there he is, Vlandis, uh, saying they're thinking of the fans. I want to get your thoughts, Smithy, on the whole situation, mate. So he's not. So Taylor May is not serving the suspension next week. It's next year, isn't it? Yeah, first two games. <sighs> um, I, I don't. I just don't know. I, <laughs> I, I think this is, this is craziness. That's what it is. Because if you okay, let let's put it this way. So, we all know, especially you, Kempi. We all know how the season ended for the Broncos, right? Mm. Now. They were missing probably one of their most influential players for a month in Patrick Carrigan for a hip drop tackle, and that's fair enough. He, he um, applied the hip drop tackle on Jackson Hastings, as we all remember, in their loss to the West Tigers at Suncorp Stadium. He got four weeks. In those four weeks, the Broncos lost three games and won one and really just put a nail in their coffin for the season. The Roosters... They've lost Lindsay Collins for four weeks for a similar incident, a, a hip drop tackle on Tom Eisenhuth against uh, the Storm. They won't see him again this year unless they make the grand final. Now, did the Roosters or the Broncos fans apply those tackles? Because I'd like to think that now they're being punished for those players not being there. Certainly the Broncos would be saying that, and a lot of people that are so-called experts of the game said that the Broncos suffered when... Patrick Carrigan wasn't available and they were a very different side. We're yet to see um, a different result for the Roosters, but as I said, they need to make the grand final for Lindsay Collins to play another game. Now, I'd like to think that he's he's quite an influential player in their forward pack. He was one of the best players in the Origin Series this year, so I'd like to think that they, would, they wouldn't mind his services through this final series, particularly this week. And then you think back to last year, Kempe, Latrell Mitchell, okay, high contact on Joseph Manu, six weeks. So he missed the entire final series and a grand final that they lost by just two points. Two points against Penrith. Now, was that was that the Rabbitohs fans' fault that Latrell performed that, that high contact on Joey, Joey Manu? No, it wasn't. So why are we now changing the rules? And I, and I bring up these three cases is because we've got the same management in the NRL. We've got the same management in our commission, yet we're changing the rules. Now, this isn't, this isn't a, a dig at the Penrith Panthers. It's not a dig at Taylor May. I'm, I'm, I'm questioning the people that make these decisions to say, oh, look, we don't want to punish the fans. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. We've never seen this before. And, and now the, the fear is that, that the concern I have is that any player that um, is charged by police or, um, you know, hopefully we don't, we don't see incidents like this occurring in the future, but I'd, I'd, I'd go out on the limb and say we may. But if people are to get in trouble, um, players in our game are to get in trouble, you know, with, with the law, with the police and uh, charged with a criminal offence... What's to say that they can't go to the NRL and say, well, listen, okay, what suspension are you going to give me? Whether it be one week, four weeks, six weeks, whatever it is. And then they say, yep, no worries. That, that's fine. I'll, I'll cop that. But I'll, I'll serve that suspension in this period because I want to play State of Origin. I want to play Test Footy. I want to play Finals. I'll, I'll do it next year. That's the, that's the thing I'm concerned about. I, I just think this is... It's craziness. Oh, he mate, should. I, I, he should. He should be serving his two weeks right now, mate. I, I couldn't agree more. And what's bizarre about this is that I don't think many people were were baying for Taylor and May to even be suspended. It wasn't really like what I don't get is okay. Why not just if you're going to make that decision, you could have you could have waited a few weeks or whatever. But the fact that you know that's all by the by now because that's all done. I agree with you, mate. If it is going to be two weeks, it has mm. to be right now, and that's that's not a crack at Taylor. No, that's at right. All. Um, no. it, it's more it's more of the the fabric of the game going forward because the can of worms we have opened up now is 
crazy. Mm. That there is going to be issues in the future. There is going to be a young man or woman that are out and they're going to do something stupid. That's, you know, young people do stupid things. And we're going to be asking ourselves, oh, Origin's in three weeks and I want to get selected. So mm, uh, can I put the suspension in after Origin? Yeah. It just doesn't make any sense. I don't, I don't understand. Yeah. Really? Don't understand. No, I, 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 I'm with you on this because, and, and as, you, as you mentioned too, like I, I don't think you know, people were sort of asking for Taylor May to be suspended. You know, the NRL made that decision. But by making that decision, how can you then say, oh, look, you know, just play this final series, um, get this out of the way. We, we don't want to interrupt, um, you know, the next four weeks of football and then do it. You can serve your suspension next year. Like, how do I, I just, I, I can, I don't, I don't know. I yeah, don't know. Some... And every person I've spoken to about this, um, and I haven't gone around to everyone I know asking, what are, you, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts? They, if it's come up in conversation, I've had the same response from everyone. They just shake their head and, and just say, I, I cannot get my head around the the NRL applying a suspension to Taylor May, but then saying, oh, look, no, you can continue playing over the next month. You can you can serve it next year. I just I don't understand it at all. Mm. Yeah, well, look, we've got some text coming in. Uh and I'll read some text from the opposing side, I, I guess. Uh, Smithy, they're on and off-field incidents, different scenarios. That's Dale from Newey. Mm. Um, I'll get your <laughs> thoughts, Smithy, but I'll make the argument off-field is, is probably worse, you well, know, because it's... It's, it's, a, it's a criminal offence, Kempy. Yeah. Like, goodness it, me. It's oh, on-field, oh. like, for example, if I, if I head high someone, it's, it's not an intentional act. Is it, I'm, I'm playing a risky game where mm. these things can happen. Yep. Whereas if I do something silly, you know, outside of the game, and again, look, Taylor and May, obviously it was it was dumb. It wasn't the craziest, worst thing no. in the world. No. Um, so again, this is this is no d- knock on Taylor. Um, he's made a stupid mistake. It's more just the fabric of the game. But I would argue on the field is should be less punished because it's part of it's in work in a high high risk, high reward kind of environment. Yeah, mate, I'm with you. I'm with you, and, and the people like questioning that, like that, that's fair enough. And you know, you, that's that's your opinion to say, oh, they're different. One's on field, one's off field. But again, I I, I, I repeat your your words, Kempy. Was is that, yeah, you know, a lot of these things that happen on field, there's 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 no intent with those actions. Okay, there's no intent to go there and 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 hurt someone. Um, and yeah, you know, just they're, they're just unfortunate. Um, parts of our game that that happen, and people pay the price. Like those guys that I mentioned before, like they 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 had the suspension. But in in, in the like we've all seen the footage, we've all seen the video um, regarding you know the Taylor May incident. Like he walked up behind him and dragged him to the ground. Now was it was it forceful? Was the was the young man in, injured? I don't think so. But at the end of the day, he he was charged. He was charged for assault. And he was found guilty of, of that charge, um, you know. And then for the NRL then to come out and say, uh, yes, um, we, we, we don't agree with Taylor May's actions. We're going to put a two-week suspension on him. But then to say, look, you can continue playing, um, you know, so it doesn't affect the fans throughout the next month. It's just, it's, oh, I don't know. It's you, you ridiculous. Know what's, it's ridiculous. What's, you know what's surprising is it, it actually kind of, and I'm sure Penrith, you know, won't really care, but it it actually hurts Penrith's image to other fans because they're like, oh, you do get protected, and you know, you... <laughs> yeah, so well, it, it, yeah, I, yeah, it does, mate. That, that's so it, that's the, that's the picture that's painted, isn't it? Yeah, that, 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 that certain treatment for certain clubs. Even though I'm not saying that that is the reason, I'm just saying that that is what fans will just say. They'll say, well, hang on a sec, like my player got done for three weeks for a head high that he didn't mean, and what, meanwhile your player, you know, he's going to suspend his suspension mm. um so yeah it, uh, mate it's um it, it to be honest it sucks for everyone i don't think taylor and may would want this heat i don't think you no know, that's right no any of the players would want this heat and and let's let's reiterate that for our all our listeners like this we're not we're not having to go at taylor may here like he's just been told what what is happening and the same with penrith panthers they're, they're just they're just going by what the nrl is saying like we're what we're questioning is the people making these decisions like i don't know Mm. We're just making it up on the go. It's That's very, what we're doing. Very strange. And again, the, the thing that's strangest for me, Smithy, is that I, I just didn't feel 
the urge from the fans of like, wow, Talon May, Talon May needs to go for two weeks. I didn't no, feel that. Like, no. If he had a copped a big fine or done some community, you know, in the you know, do some community things with the game to pay yep. back or whatever, I think a lot of people would have been like, okay, really dumb mistake from a young man. Fair enough. We mm-hmm. all move on. But the fact that the two games are suspended, it's bizarre to me. It's absolutely bizarre. Yeah. But um, give us a call. 1300 01 1170. We want to know your thoughts about everything going on, where it's finals footy, where it's suspension, whatever it is, uh, or text 0457 736 736. We're going to head to a break, but I tell you what, we've got a cracking show ahead of you. We're going to go into deep dive. You're going to have Smithy, deep dive, into rugby league, some of the best mind, well, the best mind, one of the best minds. <laughs> I was going to say minds, plural, and then I was like, uh, I don't know about that. Uh, but we'll have Smithy do a deep breakdown into finals footy. See you after the break. Welcome back to the Captain's Run with Cameron Smith. Make sure to call in 1300 01 1170 or give us a text 0457 736 736. Make sure to follow at SEN League on Instagram for all of your rugby league updates. It's got some of the biggest personalities in the game. You've got Smithy, you've got Johns, Matty Johns and Andrew Johns. You've got uh, Brian Fletcher, you've got Vossi, you've got Brandy. You honestly couldn't ask for a better lineup. That's at SEN League. Um, now we've got plenty of calls about Taylor and May. And I just wanted to remind everyone that, like, Taylor May didn't ask for this. He, he's mm. been told what's going on, and, and it's, it's been the decision above it. But uh, we've got Mark from Bronte. Mark, you there, mate? Yeah, look, I agree with you guys. Look, um, we saw what happened to Hastings with that hip drop, and his season ended, and that, so did Balmain's. Uh, that's the, that's the, that could have been easily the same outcome with this. Look, the land is reminds me of a dodgy used car salesman. Normally, the scamming catches up with them, and I think this is going to be the beginning of the end. You can't, in this day of an age, you just can't put this through without uh, there being bad problems with him. Yeah, no, fair point. I think, um, well, Kemper, we're looking at a lot of the texts coming in and um, a lot of people are saying, yeah, they're, they're completely confused by the decision made by the NRL. You know, some we've got some texts here saying, what if Taylor May was moving clubs? You know, do the, does the new club get punished then, the fans, next year for an indiscretion um, that should be sorted out this year? Um, it's just... Uh, it's a good call from Mark. I think um, you know, as as we're saying, this 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 isn't this isn't a Tail and May thing or a Penrith Panthers thing. They, they've just been told what the decision is. Um, so I think a lot of people are just they're, they're just saying what's doing to the NRL and the commission really. And and you know, Mark, in regards to the future, it, it, he's you're right, mate, in the sense that th- this isn't going to be something that I guess just ends now because we're going to face another problem. And then we're going to be faced with a tough decision of, does he also get his suspension postponed? And then Vlandy's again, is going to have to come out and, and, and face it again. And, and so it's going to be, you know, Vlandy's done some really, really good things for the games. Mm. But, at this, you know, I, I don't know if I agree with this decision. I, he, as I said, really good things, especially through, um, you know, the, the lockdowns and all that kind of stuff. I, I just got to, this decision for me is just a bit just doesn't seem to add up long-term for us. Um, so thanks for the call, Mark. Appreciate it, mate. Now, we've got Nathan from Bonnie Hills. You there, Nathan? G'day, guys. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, Nathan. <clears throat> Very good. Um, mate, I think we can all agree that um, the NRL's decision was wrong. Um, should have had the, the, the ban straight away. Um, and we all know Taylor made, you know, he made a mistake. Everyone knows that. But... Um, we need to look at the other side of the, the kid in the bar. Like, did he, you know, what was he saying? Um, once once these players are outside of the stadium, you know, you can't get up in their face and question them and, and intimidate them. Like, has, has he got something to answer? Like, I don't think it's fair um, on the players um, that they get... We all understand their role models and things like that, but I just don't get that the, 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 the 18-year-old kid, I think it was, uh, just gets off... Without any, you know, any uh, any warning or anything, you know, like you can't just walk up into someone's face and and expect nothing. Yeah, no, that, that's that's abs- that's a fair point too. Um, and I'm not sure what's happening with with the other uh, young man in in uh, involved in this incident. Um, but like, it's a common thing. It's a really common thing, and unfortunately, if if you look at it that way, it may not be the right word, but that's that's what you know, elite athletes not just in this country but right around the world they need to deal with is when they're out in public they they are known to the public um at times they're they're going to be stirred up and 
you know, people unfortunately going to try and get at them um, in, in, in different ways um, just to try and get a reaction from them. Um, you know, so, I, 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 you know, we can't, I don't know if you know Kempi, but I don't know, I can't comment on, on what's happened with the other bloke. Um, that's just, he's just being a pest really. And, and I'm sure, you know, the actions of Taylor May, he, I think he was, it looked as though, you know, he was trying to look after, you know, one of his teammates, Nathan Cleary was there. But when you make these decisions, you you got to understand that that there are consequences. If it goes wrong, there are consequences. And unfortunately, more times than not, when you when you have a profile and um, you know you're in in the public spotlight, more times than not, that <laughs> that that spotlight will be on you more so than the other person. Yeah, mate, it's uh, you're totally right, Smithy. I mean, I'll be 100% honest. When I was coming through, um, you know, I had a scuffle at a bar and it was over, you know, some bloke had said something to some women. Mm. I told him not to. Then there was a scuffle ensued. And I'm just lucky that uh, the owner called me in and basically, you know, was understood my situation and, and it didn't go any further than that. So, you know, I can't, I can't sit here and say Taylor Mays did, you know, the worst bloke in the world because... I made the same mistake at the same age. I was around 19 years old, 20 years old. Um, does it make it right, though? No, it doesn't. You know, I, I did the wrong thing in that regard. And I also think Taylor May going forward will probably learn that although that the pests are out there and they're going to look for ways to instigate things and you've just got to find a better way to, to handle the situation. So I get what you're saying, Nathan. Like, it's it's just like these blokes are human and if you're constantly being a pest or the, the reports the reports were and I, I can't confirm or whatever happened but the reports were that he was videoing Cleary and then Cleary asked for the video to be deleted or something along those lines um, and so mate I agree with you it, it is it is tough for some, sometimes for the players especially when they're young in that environment and they're not yet equipped to deal with it in the best way possible. Um, not excusing Talon at all, but that's just the reality of the situation. So I see what you're saying, Nathan. Yeah, um, exactly. Um, Denon, you're exactly right, mate. We're all human, so mm. public perception and reaction needs to adjust. Yep. Mate, thank you Good so much you, for the call. Appreciate it, mate. We got a, we got a, text, Bye, we got a text here too, Kempi. It says, um, hey, boys, um, on the two-game suspension and whether it was deserved or not, I'll remind you that Reese Walsh, Brandon Smith and Cameron Munster all served two game bans following their off field discretions and I think that was directly after their incidents as well. So mm, there was no you remember true. you remember the Brandon Smith, uh Cameron Munster, Chris Lewis was involved as well. End of end of last season it was, wasn't it? When they were knocked out um against against Penrith. Um it was just before the Delhi M's and so they served their suspension directly after that, the the following two matches. Um, as well as Reese Walsh, was that the middle of this year? Was it middle no, of this Re- year, middle of last year? Last year, Reese Walsh situation. Yeah, last year. So that and that that that, that those two game suspensions happened directly after the incident occurred. Welcome back to the Captain's Run with Cameron Smith. Give us a call oh four five seven seven three six seven three six, or uh, sorry, give us a text, or you could call us on thirteen hundred oh one eleven seventy. Give at SEN League a follow, or you can follow us on Spotify and Apple, The Captain's Run. Give us a follow. You can listen to us anytime. Now we've got Sean from Bundy on the line. You there, mate? You there, Sean O? He's, uh, He's dropped okay, out. Okay, we'll try again in a little bit, but Sean was uh, going to call up about the Broncos. Uh, oh. oh, no, Sean. You're trying to make me have a bad weekend, mate. <laughs> Is he there? You there, Sean? We got him. No, no, not there. Okay, okay, we'll talk about it anyway. The Brizzy Broncos. I mean, I'll, I'll get your thoughts, Smithy, before I um, give my thoughts. But yes. I guess outside looking in, mate, we have, well, statistically, we have never seen a team so drastically fall out of the top four all the way out of the finals. That has never happened in rugby league. So this isn't just a, um, you know, some bad form at the end of the year. This is historical. Uh, what are your thoughts with the Broncos and what, have, what would you identify as ways to fix a problem? Um, I'm not. Uh, this is this, it's a little bit confusing, you know. Looking outside in, the, the people obviously involved with the Broncos and particularly the football department would have a fair idea. But um, yeah, I, I haven't quite seen a team fall off the cliff like they did this year. Well, maybe maybe you could throw Manly in there as well. Um, those two teams they looked finals bound six weeks ago, and then they just it, it's 
it's almost like they, they forgot how to play football. And they were, just had a completely different attitude to their football when they turned up every weekend to play. Mm. And, you know, I, the, there's no doubt that, you know, Patrick Carrigan's suspension had an effect on that footy side. But with the results that you you look at over that, that last month in particular, and I know they played some quality sides in, in Parramatta and, and the Roosters and the Storm, but to be beat by 50 and 60... That's just that's that's not a, a side who are only what three weeks prior to those games being played. They were sitting they were sitting fourth. Yeah. And I think Kemby, you mentioned like that was. There's never been a team in the NRL era, sitting fourth with six games remaining, not make the finals. It's mind blowing. It's mind blowing. And and you know a lot of people, there's there's some differing op- opinions on the Broncos this year. So they finished what second last in 2021. So people are saying, "Oh, look, I think it's I think it's a su- successful year." You know, putting together what they have twelve wins, mm. you know, compared to I think it was like six or something last year. So they've improved. Others are saying, "Well, like it, it's a failure, but because of where they were only only six weeks ago, compared to now missing out on the top eight." Um, and and I'm sure I am sure that that the coaches and the players in particular they'll look back on some of the losses that they've had this year, like against the West Tigers in particular, when they were playing at home, playing against a side running dead last. They'll look at those games and and they'll just they'll think back and they'll they'll rue the opportunity that they had. If they win what two more matches, they make the top eight. Mm. It's just you know, and and all of a sudden you go from from people questioning whether it's a successful year or not for the Broncos to say how good's this? They've turned around a season where they were absolutely awful, running second last, to now being a, a final side. Mate, it's uh yeah, we've actually Sean. He's uh he's re- he's rejoined it. Oh, Sean, he's back. you there, mate? Yeah, guys, how are you? Going good, mate. Hey, um. So Broncos are doing their end of year review and all the rest of it, and you know I know on Kempy's other podcast and stuff, he said it's like something's happened to have just fallen off the cliff. Um, my thoughts were maybe it's the whole Payne Haas thing and it's caught up. So then going into next year with Benny Hunt being off contract, do you move Payne Haas on and try and get Benny Hunt in at five eight? You know, retire him as a Bronco over the next couple of years. He can help Ezra Mam. Ezra Mam can be a 14 off the bench. His defence is good enough to play, you know, minutes in at nine if you need to, or Benny Hunt can, and then work that way. Yeah, look, the the, the Broncos have kind of proven that they absolutely still need more experience. I thought that, I think for a period there, we were sitting there going, no, no, we've got the experience we need, and this young gun side is going to be enough. Um, in regards to, you know, your questions of, like, where do they improve, I think that this young side needs to sit down and go, okay, you know, maybe we disagree with certain things or whatever, whatever it is that they disagree with. Then they need to take another step back and go, you know what, put that all aside. We need to be better. We need to take responsibility for the end of this year. It, it's no one else's fault. It's not the coaches. It's not the coaching staff. It's not the admin. It's our fault. We were on the field. We were the ones playing like that. I think if the Broncos, let's say the Broncos lost all those games, but it was by six points. I don't think anyone would have an issue with that because we'd all go, you know what, maybe it is the game plan that needs a little tweak. Maybe it is, um, you know, certain positions or selections or whatever. But when you're losing by 50 and 60, that's not game plan. That's not selections. That's not any of that. That is purely attitude. That is purely attitude. So in regards to the Payne Haas situation, um, I've, I've said all along, mate, if he wants to go, I think he should go. And if he wants a million dollars, I think he should go and get a million dollars somewhere. And the only thing that I would ask for, from Payne is give us enough time to find a replacement. And I agree. If if, if Benny Hunt or, or Munster are on the market and then Payne Haas wants the a million dollars, I would I would be more than happy for him to get that a million dollars that he wants. And we can use the 800 to a million dollars to try and get a guy like Ben Hunt or Munster to help the development of guys like Ezra Mann, but also to help guys like Reynolds who, you know, they're... As good as Reynolds is, he needs a bit of help. What What are your thoughts, Smithy? Um, yeah, well, just on the Broncos situation, yeah, I agree with you with the with the attitude issue. I think that's that was the main point. Particularly, you know, attitude is is the main part of defence. So, and their defence was was poor throughout that the final stages of of the season. Um, the Payne Haas um, piece that that's going to have to take some working through with himself and the club. Um, 
Look, if he's chasing a million dollars, I'm not too sure whether he'll get a million at the Broncos. I just, I just, I don't think that will happen. Um, so you know, we unless he's willing to to stay for for less, I, I'm sure he could pick up a million dollars elsewhere at another club that that are looking for a player like Payne Haas. But I just don't think he'll get that at the Broncos. Um, you know, because they're trying to retain a few other guys as well. And if I think if Payne takes a million, they won't be able to retain those players. Um, so there may be some some movement there as well. But uh, yeah, it's it's they're going to have to have a pretty honest um, review of their year. That's what the Broncos will have to do because there's there's no doubt that they, they should have been playing finals. There is absolutely no question about that. They they were finals quality. And something has happened, um, you know, whether whether it be... It, it's not just the, the suspension of Patrick Carrigan. As you said, there was a huge shift in, in their attitude towards their football, Kempi, in the, in the, in the um, latter stages of, of this season. So um, they're going to have to have a huge, a, a real honest sit down and review what had happened in particular the closing stages of this year and, and make sure that they have a huge preseason and, and that this doesn't happen again. Absolutely. Sean, thanks for the call, mate. Appreciate it. No worries, folks. Have a good one, eh? Yep, they're the, uh, the Broncos. Again, I, I agree with Smithy. It's, you know, you can point fingers all day long, but until you sit down... And it's something that it took me a few years to learn, if I'm being honest, when mm. I was a rookie. I don't know about you, Smithy, but when I was 18 years old, I was very, it was very quick to point the finger over like, well, what about that? <laughs> what about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yep. it wasn't until I got a bit older until I realised... That means nothing. Everything that happens to me is is my responsibility, and I have the power to kind of change that. I, I, Smithy, thoughts on that? Yeah, no. I think first and foremost, I think each of the each of the players, and we're talking, you know, just Broncos here, but every single player involved in that footy side this year that that played any sort of minutes in in uh, the games throughout twenty twenty two, they need to sit down and think, you know, did I play as well as I could every week? Mm. And if not, wh- why not? Yeah, like what was the what was the difference between when I played well and when I played poorly, mm. and that, like that's that's how you improve. Yeah, and if you improve yourself, the team improves, and that's what that's what everyone should be constantly looking for is improvement. Mm. Um, you know, so and and that's that's not just players that that should be the coaches as well. You know, they need to review their season and and look for ways that they can be better um, with the way they went about their coaching on the field, the way they may have managed the squad throughout certain periods of the season. But um, you know, to, for to to fall off the perch like they did, something has gone wrong. Whether it be, um, you know, their preparation, their training, you know, certain individuals, whatever it was, they each need to sit down and have a look at their own backyard first before they start to break it down as as part of a bigger group. Welcome back to the Captain's Run with Cameron Smith. Make sure to give us a call on one three hundred oh one eleven seventy and ask your footy questions. We might even break the call record. Whether you want to talk about the Broncos or you want to talk about the huge Roosters Rabbitohs clash or you want to talk about Cam Munster. Uh, because I tell you what, we talk about him every single week. Uh, <laughs> let's get into it then. So Cam Munster, the contract future, the only reason why we're doing this is because it has been an update. Munster has confirmed that incoming Tigers assistant coach Benji Marshall has contacted him to see if he'd be interested in joining the club. Uh, now, he's also said that he's going to put all contract talks uh, basically aside until after the season is finished. Uh, really, really interesting, Smithy. What do you reckon about the Cam <coughs> Munster situation? Well, it just um, it just keeps rolling over every day, doesn't it? And there's mm. there's more news about it, new clubs popping up, and, and rightly so. Like, why would you not want the services of Cam Munster? Like, I, Benji's just doing his job as an incoming coach with the West Tigers, just ringing uh, Cam up and just asking him about his opinion of the club and whether he would um, entertain the idea of, of joining the Tigers. If, if I'm being honest, I don't think so. I think there's two, there's two clubs that... Cam Munster will be playing for in, in 2024. It'll either be the Storm, he'll stay at the Storm, or he'll move to the Dolphins. That's that's Bron- really all I can see him doing. Broncos? Broncos. Um, well, I, d- I don't know. Can they afford him? Well, like, that's let's the say thing. that Haas does move on. Let's just assume he does. Do you reckon there's a chance? Um, Give me some hope here, Smithy. Give oh, me some hope. Possibly. <laughs> oh, well, like, well, you can't say no. 
Yeah, but yeah. I'm just saying if the if their squads stay the same, um, mm. I I don't know if they can fit him in. Yeah. Given given the chat around the Dolphins and and what's been reported as their yeah. offer to Cameron Munster, you know, million plus. Mm. Um, you know, I've, Braith and Nasta has come out and said that the Storm are in the ballpark now. They've they've upped their their offer. I, I'm I'm sure I am I'm sure I was told at the end of last week there was a deadline on Cam Munster. Mm. From from the Melbourne Storm to give them a decision, I'm sure I'm sure I was told that 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 may be wrong, but I was I was told that he was given a deadline. But obviously that that hasn't happened. He's he's learnt from the master Craig Bellamy. Just said no, nah, I won't be I won't be giving you a decision by deadline time. I'm just going to play on. <laughs> yep. Because um, I think I think in his last contract negotiation, Craig Bellamy had about twelve deadlines mm. that he just went nah, I'm not giving you an answer. Um, it, it, yeah, my gut feeling is Kempy that it'll it'll he'll he'll either stay at Storm or if he moves it'll be to the Dolphins. Because mm. he come yeah. out, he made some comments during the week, didn't he? And he and he spoke about it. he goes, oh look, it's yeah, you know, I've got a partner now, Bianca, and uh, um, they've got a, a young child together. It's not about just me anymore with my decision making and and my future where um, I next sign my contract. It's it's about my family and 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 what's best for. Our entire um, our entire situation. Um, I'm not on my own anymore. Where I can just make decisions for myself. It's it's got to be what for what's best for my family. And um, I know that you know his um, his partner Bianca. You know she's she's got family in in the Sunshine Coast. So that I'm not saying that that's well. It's just locked in that he'll be moving. Um, but I just if if he is to move, I feel as though it will be with the Dolphins. Now, we've got some text here, Smithy. Uh, hey, Kempe and Cam, just wanted to get your thoughts on Blake Braley's game. He seems to get a lot of criticism from Sharks fans, and most of the time I find it completely unwarranted. Why would, why would, why would he be getting copying it from the, the fans? Well, I, I think, the, 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 again, I, I don't disagree. I think he's been fantastic. But I yeah. think, you know, when you compare him to, like, the explosiveness of a Coruscant or a Cook or a Grant... Um, maybe that's the knock, even though I think he's been outstanding this year. What are your thoughts, mate? Yeah, no, I, I think he's a great young player. I, mm. I think he's a, a fantastic player, and he's a big big reason, a, a big part of why Crittinella finished <laughs> second on the ladder. Like, really? <laughs> oh, that's surprising to me. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I wasn't aware of that. And, um, yeah, I, look, I, I think he's a fantastic young man. He's um, He's a great footy player. He's still learning his trade. Like he's only how old is he? 20, 20, 22, 23. Yeah, 23, 23. So he's still got much more learning to 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 happen. Um, and I think his his career, like his his projection, is only on the up. And you I look at you, you what, look at most sorry. you look at most most clubs that that perform well during the year. A lot of that is is comes down to their their number nine having a great season. Mm-hmm. Like you, you, you like go go through the Ross, go through the ladder. Like Penrith, Appy Coruscant has been fantastic again. Braley at Cronulla, um, Starling for North Queensland, possibly. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I think it, I think it was. Um, oh, sorry, Robson, not Starling. Yeah. Reese Robson for um, North Queensland. He's been outstanding. Like he got called into the New South Wales squad mm. um, this season during during the series. Like he would have been close. Like if it wasn't for out and out, you know. Elite players like Cook and um, Coruscant for, for New South Wales, like he, he'd be playing State of Origin, mm. you know. And then um, you, you look through that entire top eight; they've got outstanding number nines. So you know, Braley, I think it's been out and out outstanding this year for the Sharks. Mate, I agree. Uh, we're going to head to a break, but before we go to the break, I'm going to ask Sharkies fans if you're a bit dubious on on Braley, go and watch how high quality his service is. He's got some of the best passing out of dummy half in the competition, in my opinion. We're going to head to a break. After the break, we're going to get into Manly's woes. Welcome back to the Captain's Run. Make sure to give us a follow on Instagram, at SEN League. I'm talking about all the best personalities in the game at SEN. Maddie Johns, Brian Fletcher, Cam Smith, Vossi, Brandy. I mean, it doesn't stop. It Denning honestly Kemp. doesn't spot. And the beak. I'm here too. <laughs> so, SEN League, give us a follow. It's got all the latest news in rugby league, all clips from all of the shows. It's the best place to get your rugby league news. Well, equal best place, I'll say. Um... Now, 
we've got some huge news, Smithy. Manly, it is an absolute... It's all uh, happening. ...shamozzle. I compare it to Game of Thrones because yes. there are different factions in that club that just don't seem to get along. Well, you know what, Campy? I'm going to uh, break some little <laughs> news here. I've never, I've never watched Game of Thrones. Oh no, so Smithy! I, I don't know what your your uh, reference is there. <laughs> Damn. Well, actually, I'm sure you... a lot of our listeners have have watched Game of Thrones. Though. Well, I'll tell so you continue, this. please continue, uh, Smithy. I'll tell you this: you're one of the lucky ones because it was the worst last season in the history of TV. <laughs> oh, really? It was disgraceful. Really? Disgrace. Like, the first four seasons are the best TV you'll ever watch in your life. I'm okay. being serious. Yes. Then five, six, okay. Seven, bad. Eight, the worst season ever. And it's all because they ran out of material and stopped listening to the writer. But we aren't here to talk about fantasy fiction, Smitty. So, uh, We're here to talk uh, about oh, sorry, the Manly... I, sorry, I thought you were talking about Manly season. <laughs> they started really well and they just oh, there it is. no good. <laughs> so you do get it, Smithy. You do get it. <laughs> okay. Yes, back to Manly. Sorry. Back to Manly. Okay, so there's been plenty of reports, but this is the bird's eye view. Essentially, and, and this, look, when they say reports, it, this isn't like a vague report. It's almost basically been confirmed by the new CEO that changes need to be made. So it isn't like you're just getting this random report and it may or may not be true. So yeah. basically what has happened is is that there are some people in the club that feel that Desi Hasler needs to change his coaching staff and you know the club is going to ask him to make those changes and there are some people that are saying that Desi Hasler thinks that he should have full control over who he hires under himself as the coach. And basically there are different factions that want different things. Now I've from my understanding is the players are fully behind Desi Hasler. That, that's my understanding. Whereas it's, it's more above the players where this tension is coming from. And basically, it's coming to a head over the next week. There's been reports of a crisis meeting. And essentially, in the next few weeks, we're going to know whether Desi Hasler is a coach next year, which is crazy to me. But I want to get your thoughts. What are your thoughts on the fact that Manly may potentially lose Des Hasler as a coach? Oh, look, I think... Um... It's it's hard to fathom that because you know like he's a club legend. I think he's a great coach. You speak to the players that have been coached by him, you know, at the Bulldogs at at Manly, and they all love Des. Like we know he's a little bit different. He's an eccentric type of fella. Like he gets into the press conferences post game, and he's his ties all over the shop. His hairs all over the shop. But the one thing he does know is is the game of rugby league, and you know I find it hard. You know, and and look, most of the comments I make around you know the like the footy department and footy teams and all that stuff, I I, I go back to my time at Melbourne and and I was really lucky, Kempi. Like I had one coach. Sorry, I had two coaches. I played two games under Mark Murray, and then the rest of the games I played was was just one coach, Craig Bellamy. So the pretty much my entire career was under one coach. I didn't have coaches chopping and changing and being questioned whether they're the right person for the job and whatnot. So. I was lucky, but in that time, Craig Bellamy he ha he had the first and last say over who his staff was. It was as simple as that, because he knew the people that he needed there to get the job done, and and the right people with the right um, that shared the same work ethic, that sh shared the same views on on the game, and shared the same direction that he saw that the team and the club needed to head in. So that he knew that he could trust those people around him that would be working in the same direction as him. So I don't understand why why Desi wouldn't have the opportunity to, to choose his coaching staff around him to help send this football side and, and the club in a direction that he feels they need to head in. I, I just I don't understand that. I, I, the thing I do understand, and I've been made aware by people that have been a part of that, that football club, is that there are people that as you mentioned that sit above the football team that um, do have different opinions on where this footy club needs to go mate it's uh, it's it's surprising because like I understand they're all high achievers and really good at what they do you don't get into admin roles at rugby league clubs unless you're a professional at what you do and so you've got to have a sense of belief in your decisions and they're the right ones but what, what I'm just surprised at is that, to my understanding, Desi Hasler is the only bloke in that building 
that knows how to win premierships. Mm. And so I don't get why they're not fully backing him because when you've got one foot in and one foot out, it's basically, let's say, for example, they clean out his coaching staff and they put all who they want in the coaching staff. And next year, Manly come out and they come 14th. Whose fault is it? That's right. Whose fault is it? Oh, it's it, it might be the new coaching staff. It might be Desi. Whereas if Desi chooses the full coaching staff and they come 14th... It's black and white. It's boom. It's right there. Live by the sword, die by the sword. Yep. And I, I just, for the life of me, whenever you look at these, the best clubs, they usually give the coach the most autonomy. Mm. Um, you look at Bellamy, you look at Robinson, you look at Bennett, um, Hasler, when he's had his incredible success. Mm. Um, do you think that on top of all of that, who's out there to replace a guy like Desi? Well, th- well, that's the big question of all of these clubs talking about, um, you know, releasing their coaches or you know, sacking their coaches, whichever way you want to word it. Um, who's there to replace them right now? Or who who's actually there ready to go as a first grade coach? Um, you know, there, there's several names that continue to be tossed up, but does that going to put them in a better place than what they are right now? And and that's why I go back to like Desi, like he's a club legend at Manly. Surely he understands the fabric of, of that organisation and what needs to happen um, with that football team. So, yeah, it's just... It's it's unfortunate, but things seem to be on the decline as soon as that, that whole Jersey thing happened. Mm. That's really like... Uh, whether or not that's true, that's, it seems as though it all lines up around that that week. In regards to the, the coaches that could replace him, think about this. They're considering replacing a coach that has been in four to five grand finals in the last 15 years. Mm. Oh, no, no, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's, that, that's, the, that's the confusing part about it, Kempi, is that like, sh- like this bloke understands the game. He, he gets it. And on top of it, like, like, I only look at it from my perspective, the Broncos. We haven't had a premiership in 16 years. And so this guy in the last 16 years has been in four to five <laughs> grand finals. Deciders, yeah. yeah. And yet he, he's going to get moved on. On top of all that, they were in the prelim last year, and he was the coach of Tom Dravojevic, who had, most people say, the best season in the history of the game. Yep. You don't do that by yourself. You do that with a good coach. No, that's right. Well, there's no doubt that Tom has a lot of natural ability. But a lot of the coaching around, around Tom uh, and with Tom... But the coaching around him to to allow him to play the way he, he, he did in that season, that a lot of that comes down to the coaching. There's no doubt about that. So, yeah, a fair bit happening at, at the Manly Footy Club right now. Hopefully they can sort it out because I really feel... I know there's a joke, you know, everyone hates Manly, but, you know, with the Travojevic brothers, I felt like they kind of turned a corner and they were almost a lot of people's second team. For me personally, I love seeing Tom Travojevic do what he did. Yep. Um, I think it's a bit... Like, okay, yep, they fell off a cliff, no denying that, but they also were without their main superstar player. Even even a club like Penrith, I think, would struggle without Cleary for a whole season. They'd probably yep. still make the eight, yep. but I think they'd struggle. Um, now, Kalen Ponga has ruled himself out of this year's World Cup to focus on the Knights of 2023. What do you reckon about this, Smithy? Uh, good decision. I think really good decision, um, especially when there's a little bit of talk that, that Kalen wants to move to six. So you've got to remember, so these players that go away on the World Cup, they'll be over there until sort of late November, um, almost into December. So they'll miss they'll miss a huge chunk of the preseason for their respective clubs, whoever goes over there. I don't think they'll be back at training until January, at least. So, um, and particularly for some of the older players, um, I'm sure that the clubs may give them maybe one or two weeks extra into next year to to just get themselves right and ready for the the 2023 season. So I think this is a really good decision um, by Kalen, whether he's made it himself or whether he sat down with the footy club and they they come to a mutual decision to say, I think it's best for yourself and and the footy club going into next year to to maybe sit out this World Cup to focus on the, the Knights, to focus on yourself getting yourself right and, and um, physically and mentally ready for a, for a big 2023 season. I, I think it's a great decision, especially if he's moving to six, Kempe. And I know they've they've made some signings. Um, so, yeah, we're yet to find out, and, and we won't find out for quite some time whether he'll change positions. But 
if he's going to do so, I think that's a that's a it's a it's a good call. I think it's a great call, and and I'm not sure about you, Smithy, but you know every preseason I did, those first you know, late October, November, December, I, I really feel like that's where you get your bonds, like it, because it's the slog, it's it's so far away from the season, and I think that I love that Caelan Ponger is is going to focus on that because I feel like as a leader of that club. He needs to be in that preseason from essentially day dot with all the young boys, everyone, his co- whoever's going to be his half partner. Because when all the rep boys come back, you're all, already kind of flying as a squad. You're yep. already kind of like nose diving into the season. What What are your thoughts? Do you feel like you get a lot of that bonding done in those first two two months? Yeah, well, I, I always felt that when I come back. So when I, I whenever I was playing in in those um, the touring. Uh, sides at the end of every year like you'd come back and and you'd feel it so I'd come back in January and sometimes Craig would give me an extra couple of weeks so I, I might come back in the middle of January and you'd come in and you'd see you'd see the relationships you'd 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 see the connections you'd feel you'd feel it mm. you'd feel you know the chemistry that had been built within the squad over you know a grueling six to eight week period prior to Christmas um, you know so like it, it's a really really important time um, for you know teams to build, as you said, those those connections, those combinations, um, which is why I feel as though that this is this is a really really good call. It's a it's a smart call by Kalen and the Newcastle's uh, Footy Club, particularly if he's if he's changing position. If he's going to make that that uh, positional switch, that transition to six, it's it's a smart call. There's no yeah. doubt about that. Yeah, I, I really really like it, and I think that it's it's best for the club. It's best for Kalen's health. Um, and I, I just think that it's going to just lean him even further into that uh, leadership role. He was incredible in the Origin Series, incredible. So the, the potential is it's all there. It's all there in front of him. I, I can't wait to see Kalen Ponga next year. Um, it's I put it this way. In in my time, and obviously it's obviously much shorter than your Smithy, but I did about, I think, eight, eight pre-seasons. Yep. Whenever we had an incredible pre-season, we usually had a good year. Whenever that that we weren't redlining and we didn't have those crazy pre seasons, we just seem to not have it. I don't know what it is. I don't know how you know training from December the year before can yep. help you in, but it just seems to be the way. Yep. Oh, absolutely, um, mate. You just you're just so well prepared. That's what it is. Mm. You're not playing catch up during the season. You're not yeah. trying to use games to to build fitness or build combinations. You just as soon as round one is there, it comes. You're ready to go. Absolutely. Now we've got a call from Al from Ride. You there, Al? Yeah, g'day, guys. How you going? Good, Al. What do you got for us, mate? That's good. Listen, mate, I wanted to have a chat, uh, Cam, about um, about the other decision that the Rugby League have made in the last or last week. It's an absolute shocker. And that's the one about Cronulla and, um, to a lesser degree, Penrith um, playing their games at their home ground. Now, I get the understanding about, you know, they've, they've, they've earned the uh, they've earned the honour to have the home ground. But, you know, Cronulla are going to have 11,000 people, mate. In this day and age, would that be something would you that, would, that you would think the AFL, would they have made that sort of decision? I mean, it's just, it, it just you know, it's unbelievable, mate. And, you know, when you've got um, Volandis having an argument with the state government about funding for, for ground, and then he's got an opportunity to to put a lot more people in seats um, at a bigger ground, and, and he hasn't taken the opportunity. I mean, I, I think Perito is well within his rights to tell him to go and go and take a hike. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a fair point. Uh, it's a fair point, but I actually, Al. Al, I think the NRL, um, and I'm not sure where Peter Volandi sat in this, but I'm I'm pretty sure the NRL they wanted to play the Sharks. <laughs> game this weekend um, at Allianz Stadium. But it, but it was the Sharks that pushed back. So it was, it was actually the footy club that said, no, no, we, we want to play. We want to play at Shark Park. Um, or po- or it's Points Bet Stadium, I, th- I You've think. You've got to take it out of their hands, mate. You have to take it out of their hands. Yeah. I mean, you know, I need to go as far as to say, give them part of the gate. Give, give the Sharks and even Penrith. I reckon Penrith and Parramatta... If they play that at Acor Stadium, they'll get 60,000 people there. And I'd say to Penrith, for you guys to take it there, we'll give you an extra million dollars. 
I mean, it's all about money these days. Yeah. Yeah. Mate, oh, hey, Al, I'm, I'm with you there. I think I think that would be really interesting if, if the NRL went to Penrith and said, hey, listen, we'll give you a million bucks if you take it um, out to Homebush, where you'd almost get a sellout between those two clubs. I, I reckon there's no doubt you'd get at least forty or 50000 out there for that one. Um, you know, So the incentive of some money, that, that may change the decision. But for these two clubs in particular, I, I believe they, they the the – the enticing part of playing at home in front of your home fans and, and trying to, you know, have that, that home crowd there, that dominant home crowd, to get you into a week off and then a prelim final, I think that's extremely enticing. That's, that's what I feel. And I'm not sure if the Sharks went to went to um, Allianz Stadium, the, the brand-new stadium, the old SFS, I'm not sure what type of crowd they'd get there. Yeah, you know, they're going to get eleven thousand. It'll be, it'll be sold out at Cronulla this this weekend. Um, but you know what? What to say if they get an extra nine thousand? Let's just say they got twenty thousand if they took it to Allianz. You got to remember they're playing the Cowboys, so they're a team from Queensland. They're, they're, I don't think there'd be too many uh, North Queenslanders or, or Queenslanders going to a first semi final. Um, so I, I can understand both sides. I, I completely understand you know your argument, Al, but. Come from a from a from a from a club point of view and a and a player's point of view, that home that home ground advantage, particularly particularly for these two sides, Penrith and Sharks, it's it's a big advantage to have playing in, in that smaller ground. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the call, Al. Appreciate it. Definitely can see your point. You know, in regards to the game, when you're looking at it from the game's perspective, you're right. Like bigger stadium, the better for sure. I, it's just it's appeasing both. The, you know, you've got players that all they care about is winning, and then you've got fans that want to go and watch the game and the spectacle of it all. So, very very good points, Al. Uh, we're going to head to the break. After the break, Smithy is going to go on a deep dive. The Penny Panthers versus the Para Eels. You cannot, don't want to miss this one, guys. We'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to The Captain's Run with Cameron Smith. Make sure to follow us on Apple and Spotify, The Captain's Run, or give us a follow at SEN League on Instagram, the best place for all your rugby league news. Now we've got a call. Kyle from Miranda. You there, Kyle? Yeah, mate. How are you? Good, thanks, mate. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, ask Smithy a quick question. Uh, Smithy, I I, like a lot of uh, people think you are the goat of uh, the NRL. A lot of people talk about your... uh, footy ability and sort of your footy IQ, I wanted to touch on your mindset a bit. You've obviously gone through a few low periods in your career um, with a couple of grand final losses and the the whole scandal and stuff like that a few years ago. I wanted to know sort of what you said to yourself and how you sort of picked yourself up after those losses, Uh, in particular that 2016 grand final loss to the mighty Cronulla Sharkies. (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Sort of what you said to yourself, how you how you pick yourself up, um, and sort of got yourself back into the groove because you guys went on to win the next year, uh, the grand final. So yeah, sort of any insight into that? Yeah, no, it's a good question, mate. Because if if you know, thinking back across my career, the the grand finals that we won, we 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 had always lost a grand final prior to that. So we lost in '06, got one in '07, lost in '08, got one in uh, 2009. The salary cap stuff happened in 10. We ended up winning in 12. Lost one in 16. Um, won one in 17. Lost one in 18. Won one in 20. So I think for me, um, it, it's just always about looking to get better. Not just year on year. Well, that, that's, the, that's the end goal is is to try and you know, be better than your previous year. But I think you look back on, on particularly when you're talking about grand final losses, they, they are, it is such an awful feeling. It is such an awful feeling, given, you know, when you when you finish the match, the final siren goes, the the other team has won. You stay out on the ground, you know, you watch them lift the premiership trophy, and you see, you know, the the feelings that they're experiencing compared to your own. And I, I remember, as soon as you see them lift that trophy, you just your mindset goes straight away to the following year, just thinking, there is no way I want to have this feeling that I'm feeling right now next year and and that just you know people can say oh look no that that didn't it, when, when they lose grand finals and they go on to win one you know when when players say oh look no that loss didn't spur me on I, I think they're telling you a little fib I really do I really do because I don't think there's any player at Melbourne 
in particular, you know, talking from experience with my teammates, I don't think there's any player that played in a losing grand final that didn't go on the following year without that just that that small part of memory in the back of our minds thinking, you know, there's no way we're going to experience that feeling again. And it just drives you. It drives you through the difficult parts of the season, you know, the grinding part of the year. You may have just played State of Origin. You come back to Clubland. It's a bit of a grind. You're turning up at training every morning early. You know, you just you use that as a just a, just to get you going again. And say, yep, that's that's right. That's that's why I'm here. That's why I'm out here, working my backside off to have myself prepared as best I can for the weekend because I don't want to experience that feeling I had last year in that grand final. Yeah, so for you personally, would you just sorry to, to add on to that? Would, would you uh, would you jump back on the tools a bit earlier? You know, get back in the gym and sort of um, get into it a little earlier, or you know, would you take a little bit more time to reflect? Or yeah, well, it's more. It's not not so much physical. I think it's it was more just you know making sure that one that you review the season and and look at areas where you weren't quite happy with as an individual and we we're talking about this earlier in the show about a couple of these teams you know Broncos and and Manly you know sort of sitting down as an individual and thinking like where where could I have been better where could I have been better in this part of the year where could I have been better in this these games and you just you you go right okay that's where I made some mistakes that's where I could have been better um, these are parts of my game that I that I want to improve and if I improve in that area and other and my, my teammates all improve in small parts of their game, we'll be a stronger side next year. So I think that's that's the most important thing is to sit down and review the season just gone and look for look for areas of your game, both on and off the field, where you can be be a better player the following year. And and then also I always made sure I had sufficient amount of time away from footy, just so that I was I was mentally prepared for the next season and and ready to go. Thanks for the call, Kyle, mate. Appreciate it. We're going to head to the news, and after the news, we're going to preview the massive clash on Friday night. Welcome back to the Captain's Run with Cameron Smith and myself. Thanks to the SCN app. Download it today for free in the App Store and listen anywhere, anytime. Time now to look at our game of the round, and we do that thanks to Suncorp. Get award-winning car insurance with Suncorp. They've won it seven years in a row, guys. So it's great insurance. If you're looking for car insurance, Suncorp is the place to get it. The Penny Panthers versus the Parramatta Eels Friday, 7.50 at Bluebet Stadium. Penny Panthers team news. All Panthers players return after being rested last week. Nathan Cleary returns from suspension, having not played since round 20. The Para Eels, no changes to the team that beat the Storm last week. Smithy, I mean, Nathan Cleary, he's back. The Battle of the West do you think he'll be slightly underdone, not underdone, done a lot, underdone a lot? Where where are you feeling or thoughts with Cleary? Uh, no, I think he'll be ready to go. He'll be he'll be um, itching to get back out there and start playing again. Of course, miss five games, um, but yeah, you know, like I've I've got no doubt that um, he'll be he'll he may be a little bit rusty um, in certain parts of the game, particularly defence. So I wouldn't be surprised if. Uh, Parramatta, they send a bit of traffic his way early. Um, you know, I, I don't think they need to step outside their game plan to actually try and go after him. Um, but, you know, certainly I think they might ask some questions um, of him pretty early in, in the match just to see where he's at. There's no doubt that, you know, physically he'll be ready to go. Like, like he'll be fit. There's no doubt he's he would have prepared himself uh, and kept um, kept himself in in good condition over the last five weeks, and 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 I, I think in a way it's um, it's given him an opportunity to to get to try and sort out some of those bumps and bruises that he may have been carrying up until that point. Um, I think we spoke about this Kempy on on the captain's run a while back after he was suspended that it this may be a blessing in disguise for for Penrith that Luai spent some time away from the field and. And also um, Nathan Cleary, like they dropped a couple of games through that period, but you know they, on the most part, they they did a pretty good job, um, continuing on their on their winning ways. Uh, but this is this is going to be a fantastic game. The only team to beat Penrith twice um, this year is, is Parramatta. Now the second game, of course, was against you know, twelve men. Um, and just to note, just to note, this this shows how good Penrith are, and and. You know, they are a champion football side. In the second half of that game, they actually outscored Parramatta. 
Mm. So they actually won the second 40 minutes. So, yeah, they're, they're a very good side. Um, look, they take a lot of momentum into this one, Para. Um, particularly, they've, they've, got, they've got a handful of players in really good form. Okay, so Dylan Brown and Mitch Moses, they're playing really well. The same as um, Gutho, um, the skipper at the back. He's in good form. But I tell you, the two blokes making the um, making a huge difference for this footy side at the moment. It's Regan Campbell Gillard and Junior Bolo. Mm-hmm. I, I think you know the, the starts in particular that those two are, are giving the Parramatta Eels have been fantastic. And coming up against a, a, a fairly formidable forward pack in in the Penrith Panthers, they'll be crucial crucial to the result. Um, tomorrow night. Yeah, mate, they, you're totally right. When Polo and RCG are on, it, they're almost um, they're almost more of an indicator of whether the Eels are going to play well mm. than Mitchell Moses and Dylan Brown. Yeah. I'd, I'd seriously go that far in regards to to RCG and Junior Polo. Um, I will say, like the like, it's going to sound crazy. It's going to sound crazy, but I actually think that the Panthers haven't been playing anywhere near their best attacking for quite a while. Mm. And I know that sounds crazy because, like, they've dropped barely any games. But when you go back a couple of years and you looked at some of their purple patches, some of their attack was, like, they were just blowing teams off the park. Yeah. And I and I think that Cleary and Luai being rested, they actually may bring that extra bit of energy. Like, look, don't get me wrong. It is it is um, not ideal, in my opinion, for them to be out this long. You would have wanted to get at least a game or two together before finals. But the best of a the silver lining is is that if they come back not underdone and with just re- renewed energy, yeah. it could be scary for finals footy. Yeah, and and that that was the point. Um, you know, we made you know five weeks ago about these two missing some footy. Um, not only does it give them a freshen up, but it allows the other players to play some footy without those two dominating on the field like like they are. You know, they're two dominant um, halves players that that control most of the style of footy that they play. Um, with that, the comment that you made about the style of footy that they play and they're not blowing teams off the park, I actually feel as though they've changed their style of footy. Mm. So, I'll, so I played against you know, the Penrith in 2020 when they were putting huge scores on opposition. And, and you're right, their style of play was let's get out on the field and just absolutely blow teams off the park early, and then we'll just we'll just defend our way to a victory. Let's put on as many points as we can early on through our power game and and through throwing the ball around and and at times throwing a little bit of caution to the win. But I feel after I feel after the the grand final in 2020 where um, Storm beat Penrith, I feel as though they they learned a lesson there and thought maybe that's. Look, that football, that style of football was great throughout that entire 2020 season that we played, and I think they went on a run of 17 consecutive wins. But most big games, that style of footy doesn't hold up. Mm. It's about defending strongly and and playing playing high percentage football when you've got the ball. So you look at the way that Penrith play now; it's all structured around, um, you know, sh- you know, strong, committed carries off their own end in their kick return. So they get that through Dylan Edwards and, and their outside backs. Then their forwards get involved. Isaiah Yo gets his hand on the football, you know, two and three times in a set. And then what they do is they grind the opposition into submission where they start making errors. Penders start gaining good field position. And then that's when they bring their attack into it. And then all they... I made a point earlier in the season, can be about this. They're playing a style of footy now where... You think, oh yeah, this is you know this is a bit of an arm wrestle. Um, you know, whoever's the opposition that Penrith are playing, yeah, they're in this match. But all of a sudden, twenty minutes down down the track, they've scored twenty points. Yeah, yep. And you sort of sit back and go, like, how did that happen? Yeah, they just yep. go try. Yeah, they just go try conversion, another set try conversion, and they just they just slowly pile the points on. So I think they're playing a much more sort of. Um, you know, not mature. Yeah, you know, these guys have grown. They've 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 um, matured a little bit with their football, but they're playing a much more patient style of football compared to what we've seen a couple of years ago. But but at the same time, just as effective. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, mate. You're totally right. You, in you just look at the, I guess the, 
if you go and watch, it's really interesting. The grand final against you guys, they came out, and if you look at their body language, they looked like they were about to get into a fight. Like, they were all so pumped up, mm-hmm. so ready to go. And you guys came out very calm. And that first five minutes, like, they just came at you. Yeah. Where, like, it was just yeah. cr- mayhem, absolute mayhem. Whereas you go fast forward to the Rabbitohs Panthers grand final, and it was the opposite. It was almost like their attack was non-existent, and they just their defense was their attack. That's yep. that's a, as easy as I can say it. Their defense was their attack, yep. and what got them the victory? You're you're absolutely right, Smithy. The victory was an error from the Rabbitohs. That's right. Um, and so that's where I go. Okay, if they can keep that standard, plus also add back that attack, that's a scary prospect. If Penrith can do that. Well, if they can have both aspects of their game firing, then oh. yeah, you sort of you look at it from a from a very simplistic point of view. You'd almost say it's it's unstoppable. Yeah, it's yeah, unstoppable seriously. when you when you look at the other the teams in the competition right now. The one thing I do like about this final series is that, um, and I know people go, "Oh, this is just that's that's easy to say," but but everyone on their day can beat any other side. Mm-hmm. I, I, I couldn't I couldn't say that about the teams in the bottom eight, but this these teams are making up the top eight. Let's just say Penrith have an off day playing against you know Canberra. I feel as though Canberra could knock them off if yeah, they play their very best. Mm. If you understand that, so yeah, so that that's all that's needed when when it comes to final. Like we mentioned this last week again. I'm going back on a few of the the previous shows that we've had, but the the regular season gone. Forget about it. Forget about it, guys. Like, mm. if you if you're sitting down as a footy fan watching this weekend, don't worry about you know last week and and whatnot. That's it's all about these teams now lining up this weekend, making the most of their first up matches, particularly for teams playing in in the elimination finals. But the mindset that these teams will have now is, we need to be the very best team left in this top eight for the final month, and we'll lift a trophy. Yeah, and, and look, on the other side with the Eels, if there is one thing I think, you know, when if you're sitting back in your Eels and you go, okay, probably in defence, well, not probably, Penrith are better than us. I'd say that Eels attack, when it's flowing, is probably better than um, Penrith. So that probably evens itself out. If I'm the power of Eels, I'm sitting back and go, what do we have that they don't? And in my opinion, it's offloads. Yep. And that's where I think that if they can just upset the systems of Penrith, like they have done twice this year, that is where they can get a bit of a victory. Because, like, Penrith is all about systems. It's all about in-your-face defense. But when you're offloading constantly, you can't get the same line speed because you've got to stay up mm. because of the offload. Do, where do you see Parra getting the win? No, I think I think it's a combination of that. They they, they they need to take their physical game to, to Penrith early. And I think that's a way of, of um, upsetting them a little bit as well is because, you know, they, they've been the dominant side for the last couple of years, Penrith. So they like to... They like to physically impose themselves on the opposition um, it's just the, it's the sport we play it's a it's a physical intimidating type of sport that if you can intimidate the opposition then you know you've sort of you've half won the battle already whereas I think Parramatta I don't think they fear the physical battle particularly with those two boys I mentioned um, mm. RCG and, and Junior Bolo I think they love that that physicality particularly watching Regan Campbell Gillard <laughs> over the last f- four weeks he is he is literally back fence running. <laughs> Watch him off the kickoff. I, I hope Parramatta receive receive first up tomorrow night. But if you can, watch where he, he he will be sitting. He will he will have his back against the fence of um, the footy field, standing you know four or five meters outside of of the dead ball line. And when the kick goes down, he will be running onto the ball as hard as he can, as hard as he can. So I think that's that's one area that they need to um, they need to start with um, a physical style of football, but then they can mix it. up. That's the ability of Parramatta when they're at their best is they they got a good mix of the physical style of footy and also that that unconventional you know second phase play where junior guys like Junior Bolo particularly um, Sean Lane is one one guy you know, I forgot to mention who's been outstanding for them on the left edge. They can get into contact. They can attract multiple defenders, and then they can get a ball away. And then all of a sudden, there's a little bit of chaos. And you mentioned about you know the structure and the systems that Penrith have, and they're so good at. 
when you upset that system and you upset those structures, particularly in defence, that's when you can get some good results for your team. I cannot waste, Smithy. We're going to head to a break. After the break, that was our game of the round, thanks to Suncorp Insurance, uh, winner of CanStar's Outstanding Claims Award seven years in a row. After the break, we'll get to your texts and calls, and we've got plenty more footy to preview. Welcome back to the Captain's Run with Cameron Smith. Do not forget, you can listen to us anytime, anywhere on Apple and Spotify, or you can download the SEN app and get any show on the SEN network uh, for free and listen to it at any time. We've got some texts here, Smithy. We've got some texts. Uh, I don't think it's any surprise the Eels back rowers will target Luai, particularly Papali'i, running at Luai uh, in the Eels attack. Um, yeah, I think they'll. I think they'll look for a bit of momentum down that edge um, through Isaiah Papali'i. Again, he's been playing another player with the with the Eels playing um, really well at the moment. So I think they'll look to build some momentum through that edge, and then they'll look to shift to their left and and. Lane is Lane's the man that they'll look to create some some uh, post line offloads. Um, they got a great combination there, like Junior Bolo shoot, shoot like short balls um, to Sean Lane. Um, Dylan Brown's got a nice combination there, and the work that Gutherson does out the back just to just to hold off some defenders to create space for Lane. Yeah, like it's working really well from at the moment. So things that are working well, they need to stick at it and, and really test out um, those two halves plays for Penrith. Hey, Goat and Sprint... Uh, hey, Goat and Sprint State Champ double underhook King worth over $40 million <laughs> who play with a collapsed Lan Kempe. Um, just wondering just wondering the thoughts on the Cowboys. Great team, but are they, are they that thug player short to compete against other teams if it gets taken to that kind of game? They have Taumalolo who is a machine, and then a lot of good workhorse-type players went up against the Storm or Roosters or Panthers, who takes it to players like Hargreaves, Radley, Nelson or Fisher-Harris, or even Tarpanet or Whiten for Raiders. They aren't thugs in a bad way, but in a tight finals game, when things are getting gritty, they can step up to uh, no matter what. Uh, what do you reckon? Are they short of a bit of a grub or what? Uh, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. So I think... I think um, I think Cotter makes up for it, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's a worker. I think that's what that's what um, our um, our text coming in there was referring to—a bit of a, a, a workaholic. But no, I, I think they got classy players all round to to be able to win. I don't think they need a a guy that's you know a bit of a um, I won't say a grub, but a guy that goes out there and just tries to intimidate the opposition and get under their skin. I I, I don't think you'd necessarily need a player like that. I think if you're playing good footy, then you just let your football do the talking. Yeah, look, I think Cotter is so tough, he kind of takes that. Like, he kind of makes up for that if you do need a niggler. He's so tough, mm. he's going to take that tough carry and go, you know, just go all day against the opposing tough men, if you will. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to head to a break. After the break, we have uh, get to your texts and calls, but we've got plenty of games to preview. Rabbitohs, Roosters, we've got Raiders, Storm, stop it. Welcome back to the Captain's Run with Cameron Smith myself. Remember, you can catch up on anything you miss from the show via our podcast, which you can download via the SEN app, or give us a follow on Apple and Spotify, and make sure to give at SEN League a follow on Instagram. All the biggest personalities in rugby league, including Matty Johns, Andrew Johns, you've got Smithy, Fletcher, you've got Vossi, you've got Brandy, it doesn't get much bigger than those boys, so give at SEN League a follow. Now, Smithy, huge, huge game, the Melbourne Storm, honestly, and this is me just being serious, not trying to not yes. trying to get under your skin, speed, yes, yes. But I, I kind of feel like if there was one team that the Raiders, I mean, the Storm wouldn't want to play, it's like the Raiders because mm. it just seems like the Raiders get up for the Storm. But anyway, uh, <laughs> got the Melbourne Storm <laughs> versus the Raiders, uh, four, uh, five forty p.m. at Amy Park. Jerome Hughes returns after missing last week with calf tightness. I reckon watch this space, watch this space. Calf mm. strains can be very um, touch or go. Then the Canberra Raiders, after being rested last week, White and Elliot Whitehead return. Corey Huttawira Noah removes to the bench, Matt Frawley to the reserves. Now, Smithy, uh, you know, it's just so interesting that they got paired up with the Raiders because the Raiders have probably the best record over the last few years at Amy Park. Like, very rarely does a team go down there and get the job done. Where do you think the Storm, what do you think the Storm need to do to get the win? Um, oh look, going off their last couple of performances, the Melbourne Storm. Now they played Parra <clears throat> and they played the Roosters, two teams in in red hot form. We know that they just 
they had way too many unforced errors. So what they're doing is they're, they're, they're applying pressure on themselves rather than the opposition. And then you, when you look at, you know, the key position players for Melbourne, um, you know, what what they're then having to do is that they're, they're having to make, you know, more tackles. They're, they're having to come up with more efforts defensively, which then when they get the ball, they're just, they're lacking energy to, to try and attack and, and try and impose themselves on, on the attacking um, part of the, of the Storms game. So, and you look at particularly like Harry Grant, okay? We all know Harry Grant's a great runner of the football. Whenever he's got an opportunity to run the ball with a marker down or unset markers, anything like that, quick play the balls, he's out and running. And when he's doing that, he's bringing, you know, the big man onto the ball. He's creating fast play the balls himself. And it just, it, the, the, the momentum just starts to build for, for Melbourne. In the last couple of games, when they're making these unforced errors, you know, with forward passes, just dropping the ball cold. Um, I think last week they had a kickoff go out on the full, which, you know, you just can't afford to happen in these big matches. What you're doing is just, you're inviting the opposition back into your end. You're inviting the opposition to apply pressure on yourself. And and really, you're minimising the opportunity for your key players to do their thing when you've got the ball because you, they've just got no energy. Like Harry Grant's been making 50, 60, 60 tackles a game when they're not controlling the football. So it's a cycle. The game's a cycle. Like you need to you need to be able to hold the ball, apply pressure to the opposition and then defend well. And then it just you just need to keep going around in that cycle until the opposition breaks. Now that takes effort. That requires effort, but it also requires concentration. And I think that's the storm of just been lacking that that combination of or they, they sorry they they haven't been lacking effort because that's what's kept them in their previous games is is all effort, but their concentration levels at time has has been missing, so that's where I get a little bit nervous this week with with Canberra they've they've won I think they've won four games in a row, they're taking a lot of confidence down here given their record as you mentioned Kempi over the last you know few years has been fantastic in Melbourne. So they've got no fear going down to Amy Park this weekend and, and going down and playing well because they know they can. They only they beat the Storm, what was it, seven rounds ago? Something like that. Only seven weeks yeah. ago they went down there and, and it was when Ryan Pappenhausen got injured, actually. It was that four in match. a row down at Amy Park. Yeah, the last four. So the, the, the fear of playing away from home against Melbourne, um, it, it's just not there for, for Canberra. The one thing I feel that may go against Canberra is that if you look at that that run of wins that they've had, it's been against sides sitting quite low on the ladder. Like so they beat they touched up the West Tigers who were just it was embarrassing for them on the weekend. Manly, we've spoken about them earlier in the show and, and where they've been at. They just snuck past Newcastle after Newcastle had like a they had a fourteen point lead at half time. Um, but they pegged them back and, and scored all their points in the second half. Um, they just smart, uh, snuck past St. George Illawarra. And then prior to that, they come up against Penrith and got beaten by 20 points. So really, that's the only question mark over over Canberra is that, yes, they, they beat Melbourne seven weeks ago, but has this run into the finals been a little bit soft compared to Melbourne where they've taken on Roosters and they've taken on Parramatta who are two teams that people are saying are flying at the moment. Yeah, no, I agree, mate. It's it's going to go one or two ways. It's exactly what the Raiders need and just build confidence, just absolutely smacking teams and all of a sudden they believe themselves again. Mm-hmm. Or they haven't been prepared the way they need to be prepared. Um, just specifically on the Storm, and, you know, I this is just, I guess, my opinion, but the only concern I have with the Storm going into this final series is just the forward pack for me at the moment, I don't know if they have that extra next level compared to some of the other forward packs. Mm -hmm. Now, don't get me wrong. The the forward packs, these are veterans of the game with incredible careers, incredible careers. But sometimes I feel that unless Harry Grant or Brandon Smith is getting them speed in the round the ruck, Mm -hmm. without Pappenhausen there, they just seem to struggle to get that momentum. And partly that is errors. No denying that. I mean, you got uh, both games 75% completion rate, which was less than their opposition. 14 errors against the Roosters, 11 errors against the Eels. Uh, and in both games, they were essentially a try away. So their effort yeah. is incredible. Yes. They almost had no right to be in those games, and they mm-hmm. did. Um, but with the Storm, again, if 
if the Raiders can find a way to shut down Smith and uh, Grant's momentum, yep. I just that's where I worry with them. Yeah, well, I think that's that's got to be their main focus in defence, particularly. So if you, if you control the Storms' ruck and you minimise the amount of times that Harry Grant's able to run the football, I think that that goes a long way to to getting a victory against Melbourne. Now, of course, you've got to contend with um, you know, Jerome Hughes is back um, yeah. at, at halfback. We all know he's a, he's a great runner of the football, and he will take you on when any opportunity presents itself, particularly when you've got a lazy defender on his left side. Mm-hmm. That's where he, he loves to come back off his right foot into space back on the left. If they're not if they're not onto that, then he he will tear their defensive line to shreds. And of course, Cam Munster. He's playing at fullback now. He's a little bit. He's been a little bit quiet the last couple of weeks. So the opposition have done a great job to to shut him out of the game. But I, I think again, that's going back to um, the errors that the Melbourne Storm made and applying pressure to themselves. They played the majority of the game from their own try line mm. because the, the opposition they were making errors coming out of their own end. Um, they were inviting teams into into attacking um, positions on the field. So when they when the ball was turned over. V- you know, via a kick or a team running on the last tackle, they were starting play one, two metres from their try line. So, you know, it's hard for any fullback to, to get on the attack from, from those field positions. So I think there's no doubt that they'll they'll go after the Storms forward pack and they'll they'll look to, as best they can, minimise the impact that Harry Grant has from dummy half because if there's if they if they lack momentum around the ruck, then it really... it, it it doesn't nullify, but it but it minimises the opportunities that guys like like Hughes and and Munster will have. Yeah, look in to in I guess the Storms' defence, I would say that Munster and especially Hughes are the best back foot halves. I know mm. Munster's at fullback, mm. but Hughes specifically, like you can be the Storm have been under the pump so many times, and coming out of their own end, Hughes will just create something from nothing. Yeah. Um, just quickly on the other end, you know, we've spoken a lot about the Storm. On the other end, in, in regards to the Raiders. Like, wouldn't you just be saying, boys, we got nothing to lose. Nothing to lose. nothing to lose here. No. And we, we have the team to beat them. We've proven it. Yeah. Well, it's well for these two teams, um, it's it's do or die. This, this is the last roll. Every every game they play from here on in is, is the last roll of the dice. So if you, if, you, if you turn up and you're no good and you lose, you're gone. The one, the, the, the one thing in Canberra's favour is obviously, you know, the form. I, I still have a couple of question marks over that with... with you know the the ease at which they've done it. Um, I think the the prospect of playing Melbourne is is very different to those other sides. But the form that they've have in Melbourne, they've got no fear of going down there. And the last time that they played them, when you look at all the key stats throughout the game, Melbourne were better. So they had a better completion rate. They had less errors. They ran for more meters. They missed less tackles. This is Melbourne. Yet wow. yet Canberra was still able to come away with a victory. Now, whether that was because of the injury to Ryan Pappenhaus, and I'm sure that had some sort of effect on Melbourne, but they still beat them. Mm. So I think that's one thing that they'll go down there and go, hey, listen, boys, we've, like, we've got a pretty good footy side here. If we can hold on to the ball, um, you know, make our tackles and have a fair share of field position, we're right in this. Now, we're going to head to a break, and then we're going to go on a deep dive. The Sharkies versus the Cowboys. Man, I'm excited for this match. So do not, do not go anywhere, because the Sharkies versus the Cowboys, we've got plenty to say about that. Welcome back to the Captain's Run with Cameron Smith. Make sure to download the SEN app or give us a follow on Apple and Spotify, and you can listen to us anytime, anywhere. Plus, follow at SEN League uh, for all your rugby league updates. The biggest personalities in rugby league on SEN League. Now, Cronulla Sharks versus North Queensland Cowboys, Saturday, 7.50 at Points Bet Stadium. The Sharkies, Talakai, Vanukin, Kennedy, Rudolph have all been named for the Sharks. And then we go to, we've got Cam McGuinness, we've got Brandon Hamlin, Ueli, move to the bench. Not, not bad blokes to have on the bench. Lockie Miller is 18th man. North Queensland Cowboys, Cohen Hess returns from suspension. Tanua Brown goes to 18th man. I mean, what a clash. Two Cinderella stories of the year. Two fan bases that are just riding the highs of a team that come out of nowhere to be in the top three of the NRL. I cannot wait to watch this, Smithy. Now, where do you see this game being won or lost? Cowboys v. the Sharkies. Uh, it may come down to... Well, it's going to come down to their ball control, obviously. That's a, that's a given, but... 
Um, I think defence. Both sides have shown um, they've improved their defence out of sight this year um, and two highly ranked teams defensively. Um, so it may well come down to who's most desperate on their try line. Um, yeah, when you're coming up against two, you know, they're two very good attacking sides as well. So they got they got great ball players, they got great outside backs who know how to find the try line. Um, it just it might come down to who's who shows the most, you know, grit in defence when it, when it comes to defending your try line. And and both teams, as I said, have, have shown that they can they can withstand multiple sets on their try line. Um, but who can do it under the pressure of a big game like this one? Um, Saturday night, it, it's a cracker. If, if I can see, if I can see one team winning um, away from home this week, I think it may be the Cowboys. I'm with you, possibly. I'm with you. Mm. I mean, I, I think I look at the Sharkies and I think their attack is is so smooth. It's so beautiful to watch. But then you look at their completion rate, and it's a big, big concern for me. And I, I, I wonder, like, put it this way. I think the Sharks have better attack than the Cowboys, and maybe statistically I'm incorrect. But when I watch it and I get a feel for it, I think the Sharkies' attack is some of the best in the competition. Yeah. But what I love about the Cowboys is that, and it was a, it doesn't seem like a huge test because you're playing a reserve-grade Penrith side, but I believe it was a huge test to them to yeah. test their mental fortitude and also test their standards. It's very easy to have high standards in big games. Yeah. But do you have those same standards in games that you are supposed to tear teams up? Yeah. And I think they pass with flying colours on the weekend. Well, if you look at when you when you're talking about um an advantage that uh Cowboys may have over Sharkies and you're talking about, you know, their their approach to last week's game and, and the professionalism in which they, they um played their, their footy with a high completion rate. You look at the Sharkies, right? And then, now they had a couple of good wins but they struggled to put away Newcastle they struggled to put away Canterbury and the their completion rates were, were weren't were great out of those two matches now against Newcastle 68% they finished with completion rate which is low it, it's very low I think teams in, in this competition their their standard or their their goal at the end of every match should be around 75% at least so you, you know, you're completing three out of every four sets of of, uh, of six that you, you get. And against the Bulldogs, their completion rate was 64%. Oh. So, and, and there, that was against two sides. Now, now you could you could argue the point to say, well, you know, they're playing against two sides that weren't playing well. And so, you know, you can forgive them for not being up. But but that's the point that we made with, with the Cowboys. They were, they were playing against a, a, a pretty much a, a New South Wales Cup side in Penrith last week, yet they went out there and played professionally like they were they were creating good habits for first week of finals. Now, I'm not too sure whether the Sharkies have actually had that, that same approach where, okay, they were good enough to put those sides away. They beat the Bulldogs 16-0, okay? So that's great defensive effort to keep them to nil, but they only scored 16. They end up putting a score... On Newcastle, but they scored a lot of points late in the match. Now, if they go into this game um, on Saturday night and complete anywhere below seventy percent, I think that's that's almost handing a victory to the Cowboys. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and another stat that's um, quite damning for the Sharkies. And look, I we feel like I feel like I'm being really negative. I'm not. I'm, not. I'm no, a big just, fan of what they've done. Yeah, we're just, just looking at the facts. Yep. They actually have the most errors by quite a margin of any club in the NRL. Right. And so that I know that hurts to hear as Sharky fans, so I'll give you something that's a positive. When the Roosters won the comp back-to-back, they had the worst completion rate in the competition, I'm pretty sure. So completion rate isn't the be-all and end-all, but unless you have superstars in your team to make up for it and score length of the field tries and all that kind of stuff that the Roosters could do, mm. that's where I get a bit worried with the Sharkies in saying all of that. They get guys like Dale Finucane back. They get guys like Toby Rudolph back. They get Kennedy back. So it's not like, you know, it's just, yeah, the Cowboys are definitely going to get the win. But I just think that if the Sharkies are to make a dent, that is what they've got to fix up. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And it's a big part of the game. And, and yeah, you mentioned that Roosters team that went back to back. They they had a pretty special footy side to be able to do that. And, and they had low completions, but... 
Um, maybe Sharkies aren't quite there where the Roosters were back in those two seasons in, in 18 and 19. But I, I'm sure I'm sure Craig Fitzgibbon has spoken to them you know, throughout the week. It's not like the, it's, it's, it's just swept under the carpet with their low completion mm. rate. I'm sure that's been identified and, and addressed. And to say, hey, boys, we cannot afford to play our football this way in finals in in the finals mm. because you you can quickly find yourself out the door in straight sets now i know they've got a second chance after finishing second both sides have a second chance but um there's plenty to play for for both sides particularly the cowboys and given you know their location okay in this competition they are way up in north queensland um so if they if they can go down to cronulla on saturday get a win, get out. They get back up to North Queensland, nice, sunny, warm weather where they get get a week off. They get an opportunity to you know sort out the bumps and bruises that they've been carrying for the most part of this year. And then they can sit back and watch, you know, two teams go at it over the next weekend in a major semifinal. And then they have to travel all the way up to North Queensland for a prelim. That's the advantage that that the Cowboys have and, and why I feel as though they've got a, maybe a little bit more to play for um, than the Sharkies. Yeah, no, I, I agree, mate. Going up to Townsville in that prelim final, it's a, it's almost like the worst road trip you could think of. Yeah, well, um, particularly this time of year, a week before yeah. a grand final. Goodness. Oh, and so I, I will say, though, the Sharks have one thing and that's a Heinz magic. You know, yeah. he may win, may well win the Dally M and any team with a pl- player that's basically neck and neck, I'd assume, with Benny Hunt, that, you know, you usually see teams that go on these runs, there's usually like one guy that's having this incredible season and Hines is that guy. And so he may have the magic to break apart the Cowboys in, from the Sharks' perspective. Um, in, in regards to the Cowboys, it's going to be really interesting to see how... I, I would say that their forward pack is outside of Tao Malolo... Oh, it's interesting. They probably have both experienced around the same, but mm. I wonder, do they have the same depth around that forward pack off the bench as Cronulla do? Dale Finucane, Cam McInnes, Wade Graham, Toby Rudolph. Um, I wonder whether Sharkies in the middle could, could do some damage. Yeah, well, well, what they lack what they lack in experience as what the Sharks bench players do have, I, I think they, they have in, in young, enthusiastic guys. Like mm. when you look at Tom Gilbert, um, you know, he's now played State of Origin and you've seen how good he went in that. Cohen Hess, obviously, as well. He's played in some really big matches. Um, and, and you know, Griffin Neem, I, I think he's been outstanding. He's played nearly every game for the Cowboys this year. Mm. Um, you know, he's a big, tough uh, forward who, you know, plays some really solid football. So what what they do lack, just off the bench in, in experience, they, they gain in youth and enthusiasm as mm. well. Which can be crucial. You, you you just you need a good mix of of that experience and and enthusiasm, particularly with the the, the way the game's played now and the rules. It's it's all about high energy, playing at speed, good leg speed, particularly through the middle. That may that may just give a slight advantage to the Cowboys forwards because when you look at the Cowboys this year, that's that's been their strong point is their leg speed through the middle. It's why it's why a number of their players were selected to play State of Origin this year, mm. was because of you know their 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 mobility, their their leg speed, their ability to move laterally across the ground. Um, so this this is a this is a cracking game. I, I can't wait for it. I'm, I'm I'm actually working on this match, so I cannot wait. You've got this you know the class of um, you know Nico Hines you know steering the Sharks around, but then you've got you know Scott Drinkwater and uh, Tommy Deard and Chad Townsend, um, you know, it's just it's it's a great matchup. Um, I feel as though if there's one game this week where the outsider can can get a win, it may be the Cowboys. Yeah, I cannot wait for this. And if I'm being honest, whether the Cowboys or Sharkies win, I'm I'm so a fan of both squads. Like yep. I really enjoy yep. the style of footy that they're playing. I'm with you, mate. Um, so whoever wins, I'd be stoked for them. Whoever loses, I'll be disappointed for them. And it's. I agree with you. I think Cowboys have a, definitely have the biggest chance to upset. Um, but, oh, man, Heinz magic. The Heinz magic could be the difference. Who oh. knows? Now, we're going to head to the break after the news. 
We've got a big, big game to preview, so stay tuned. Welcome back to the Captain's Run with Cameron Smith. Uh, thanks to SEN 1170 in Sydney, SEN 1620 on the Gold Coast, and 693 SENQ, Sydney Roosters versus the South Sydney Rabbitohs. Sunday, 4 p.m. Alliance. How good a Sunday Arvo sh- uh, showdown. Sydney Roosters team news. Suali'i, Tupo, Radley, all return to the starting side. Manu was out for two to three weeks with a calf injury, so Momoroski starts at centre. Tokiaoho starts at prop. Lodge moves to the bench, and Adam Keegan is the new man on the bench. I'm surprised about Lodge moving to the bench. I thought he was incredible the first 20 last week. Now, South uh, Sydney Rabbitohs, Cam Murray, Cook, Graham have all been named to start. After suffering a concussion last week, Cam Murray will go through all the protocols to test his fitness. Thoughts on this game, Smithy, and where it is won? Uh, well, the Roosters, you know, they only played a week ago, these two teams. So the, the Roosters were fantastic in the first 40 minutes. They really, did, they just dominated that first half of football. Um, it took, it took you know, the second 40 minutes for the Rabbitohs to get going. And, and to be fair, like they looked, they looked pretty good. Um, the big one is Joey Manu. Like he, him not being available for this game is huge because he was strong up until the point where um, he hurt himself, and and as we know, like he he's great with the football. Like he he's he's a great runner. He comes off his centre position, gets around the middle. Sometimes he's even on the other side of the field, um, and carries the ball. Like he's he's matching, yeah, you know, the running statistics of Tedesco. Like both of those guys, like they're combining for you know close to two hundred meters. Or Teddy ended up finishing with more than two hundred last week. But both players over the last little bit have been averaging around that two hundred mark which is incredible to think that you can have two outside backs making those type of meters, but it shows it's a big reason why the Roosters have gone on the run they've they've had. Like, they've won eight eight in a row um, leading into this one. It'd be interesting to see the impact it has with, with Joseph Manu out because Paul Momorowski, he's a very different style of football, although he's very skillful. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't possess that same running ability of a Joseph Manu Um and and you know you, you you cannot take away the fact that you know the the injury to Cam Murray in the second tackle of the game last week, the effect that it had on the Rabbitohs, yeah, in the first half you you could tell you could tell straight away when without his presence there, not only the work that he does defensively, but I think more more so with the ball can be, because when he carries the football, he he creates multiple questions that the defense have to answer. First and foremost, they have to take care of Murray when he's carrying the ball because he's so strong with the football, and he's an awkward style of runner where you know you really need to get a hold of him because if you don't, he'll he'll get to the ground quickly, he'll get up quickly, and then he creates fast play the balls for for you know well Damien Cook wasn't there last week, he'll be there this week. He creates fast play the balls for Damien Cook, and then they're away. They are away. Walker, Ilias. Uh, Mitchell, they all jump on the back of it. You know, they're big forwards. They start, you know, just rolling down the field. And he, when he wasn't there, they just they lack that 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 attacking option. Um, on top of that, his ability to play the ball fast, like he's he's a great link in the middle for Walker and Ilias. Yeah, you know, just to try and take time and 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 pressure off off those guys. Um, so his inclusion back along with Damian Cook, um, Campbell Graham as well, um, starting. I, I think it, it brings it back to uh, a much more even contest. I don't know. I just I, uh, there's something about the Roosters at the moment that I, I really like the style of footy that they're playing. Maybe though, just just maybe playing on an, an afternoon match, like it's going to be sunny and fast. They may have to tweak the style of footy that they they have been playing of late because I think most of their games have been at night and the way that they've played just that that power just that bang 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 down the field, Kiri and uh, Walker kicking really well, pinning um, you know opposition teams deep back down on their own line. I don't know, may, maybe that they may have to tweak that a little bit given it's a you know that style of footy suits night games and, and when it's a bit dewy and a bit slippery um, but they may need to tweak it a little bit in this fast track Do you think that that's maybe why Lodge was put on the bench rather than starting because for maybe fatigue factor and Tokiaho has a bit of better of a motor Yeah well, I, I think maybe they're I, I think maybe 
the Roosters may be just going for that one-two punch mm. um, of um, Hargreaves and and um, Lodge rather than rather than starting those two, which and they have been great. Like you said, like it was a little bit surprising to to see him named starting off the bench um, because they've been they've been fantastic. Those two, I think Lodge picked up man of the match against Melbourne only a couple of weeks ago. And again, fantastic. His opening 20 minutes was great, um, along with Jared Weir Hargreaves. Um, I think they may just... They might be looking for a one-two punch this time. Mm. Mm, so they, they, I think I think he may... Big Takiaho may stay out there a bit longer. And then when Jared comes off, I think he'll replace him with Lodge, just so they've, they've got the two big aggressive guys out there at, uh, you know, at, at some point in time. Um, rather than rather than them both starting and then the possibility of them both coming off at the same time. Yeah, it's interesting because when you look at Tokiaho's season, one of his best games, he was accidentally left on the field for like 60 to 70 minutes. And Robinson said in the press conference, uh, like the exchanges got stuffed up or whatever. <laughs> yeah, the interchange, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. interchanges, sorry. And Tokiaho stayed, you know, stayed out there and ended up killing it. It was like seventy-one minutes or whatever. And so I wonder whether that's played into his decision to leave him out. There yeah, already. I think I think that uh, that might have been the game against Penrith. I'm mm. pretty sure that may have been the game against Penrith. And there was a bit of confusion down in the in goal area where they were trying to make a sub. I think Lindsay Collins ended up coming from the field instead of Takiaho, mm. and he stayed out. He just stayed out there and had a blinder. Yeah. It was the game where they they played really well. It was out of Penrith, um, mm. and they had a good chance to win. And there was a couple of 50-50 calls that didn't go their way. Um, but, yeah, look, there's no doubt that um, Siwa Takiyaho, he, he is a fantastic player, and it's a huge matchup, huge matchup this week. I think another uh, huge in is Tupo, uh, you know, bringing in that, that ball running out of his own end. He, he just... I, I feel like he never gets the appreciation that he deserves, maybe because he's in such a star-studded so, uh, side. Mm. But a guy like Tupo... Adding those extra meters, I do think that yes, Manu is a massive loss. There's no denying that. Yeah. But when it comes to meterage, Tupo can li- lift a lot of that slack and and kind of pick up where Manu left off. Yeah. Well, well, they're, they're different style of players, aren't they? So Joseph Manu, he just roams throughout the field, mm. whereas whereas um, Tupo, like he's in his set structure of a set. So if he doesn't bring the ball back on a kick return, if let's just say it's Tedesco, you know that Tupo's next. Mm. He's going to be carry too. And when he's in good form, like he is right now, he carries the ball strong. Like you think back to those couple of seasons where they went back to back as, as the premiers, he was carrying the ball just as well as Joseph Manu. Like he he yeah. was finishing games in, in the high hundreds, maybe even clicked over two hundred meters, in some of those matches. Mm. And you just watch the Roosters. So a kick goes in behind them. You see their big forwards. They turn. They don't try and get back behind the ball. They turn. They they walk for a little bit and they get they get their breath because they know they've got Tedesco, they've got Tupo, and also they get Suali uh, back this week. You know, three very strong ball carriers um, in their football team that they know that okay, let's this is where we get our breath. We'll let our let our back three do their job, do their work where they where they carry the ball strong, gain you know twelve meters for us, and that's where the Rabbitohs need to target the Roosters. If there are any chance, if there are any chance of taking this game off the Roosters, they need to target their back three. Now we all know, you know, the form that Tedesco's in and he, he's going to pop up everywhere. Every single player in the Rabbitohs outfit will get an opportunity to tackle this bloke. He is everywhere. He gets, he plays as a halfback, he plays as a fullback, he plays as a centre, he plays as a front rower sometimes, just taking hit-ups early in the tackles. So every person in this lineup will get a shot at Tedesco. But when they kick long, they need they need to have a good kick chase, a, a, you know, some some intent in their kick chase to go down there and minimise the meters that these back three make because because they put the Roosters put so much emphasis and responsibility in those three players making good meters early, so they can get into their they can get into their attacking game. But if they minimise their meters, Kempi, then it goes a long way to the changing that game plan that they'll take into it. Oh, I totally agree, mate. It, to be honest, the Rabbitohs need to do what the Roosters did to Latrell when he was returning the ball. It needs yeah, to be yeah. <laughs> almost like uh, like as soon as they see Tedesco with the ball, blokes need to be flying at him. And yes, I understand it's hard. It's Tedesco. He's hard to tackle. Mm. But oh, I totally agree, mate. They should be kicking into corners and they should be using that as an opportunity to attack their back three. Kick into corners, the next two tackles, 
we need to win the ruck. We must win the ruck. Because if you don't win those first two tackles, the whole set's over. It's yep. just done. Yep. Um, the Rabbitohs, though, I agree in regards to the Cam Murray. He's so important to that side. You know, Cody Walker doesn't get released unless Cam Murray is in the ball in the middle ball playing. Even Cam Murray just being there as an option gives Cody Walker more time. Um, the, the way the Rabbitohs win it is via Cam Murray. In my, he, he is the guy that's going to get the job done. Yep. If he, if they give him enough space to create space for Cody, we know what him and Latrell can do. But if if they don't, if Cam Murray isn't heavily involved around the ruck, I just don't know where they're going to find their pump uh, their yeah. points. I just, I, you know what, can be. I just hope Cam Murray gets through the game unscathed. Mm. I really do. I just want, I want him to see. I want to see him play a, an eighty minutes of footy, play it out without getting concussed. And I know it's hard to predict what's going to happen, but it's just shocking seeing him. It happened to him not just last week, like game three, State of Origin game yeah. three. Like, ta- was it the first tackle? It was the first tackle of the match, wasn't it? Uh, pretty much, yeah. yeah like, South Wales, I'm pretty yeah. sure it was the first tackle of the match and he, he went down with concussion and we didn't see him again. So let's hope Cam Murray can stay on the field because you're right, he, he goes, he's such an integral part of their game, not like all round, defence and attack. And I think what he can do too, like as you said, like he, he complements the style of footy that Ilias and, and Cody Walker play. But what he does do, he, he creates opportunities for um, for Damian Cook as well, which I think I, I think is a... You know, sort of people are forgetting that he wasn't there last week. Mm. Um, yeah. Havili had to play hooker, and then um, and then I think he went off with a HIA as well. Um, so so they had some issues with their number nine positions last week. Whereas Damien Cook comes back in if he is out and running, if he is out and running early this week, that that's a clear indication that the Rabbitohs are on mm. and they're ready to go. Well, it's, it's one point of difference you'd say the Rabbitohs have over the Roosters. It's around the ruck with Damien Cook. Now, we're going to head to a break. After the break, we'll share our holy schnitz sporting moments of the week. Welcome back to the Captain's Run with Cameron Smith. Now it's time for the holy schnitz moment of the week. And I'll tell you what, Smithy, I was yelling holy schnitz at the top of my lungs. Yeah. The Raiders' first half domination of the Tigers leading to 42 nil after just 40 <laughs> minutes. Wow. I cannot believe we saw that. I mean, it's one thing getting absolutely towed up by say Penrith or the Storm or the Eels. Yep. The Raiders, although looking good, they're sitting eighth and you got absolutely annihilated by them. That was crazy. Something, I mean, what's the, the crazy thing is, is the last time I saw something like that happen, it was a, the Tigers with the, the Melbourne Storm in the yes. first half two years ago. Yes. Um, so that was my holy schnitz moment. What was yours, mate? All right, mine was I was sitting down watching the uh, the US Open or watching the men's quarterfinal, and when Nick Kyrgios was beaten, and like he was, he was I would say red hot favourite to take out the entire tournament, wasn't he? Yeah. But when he went on, he just smashed. I went holy schnitz. Holy. Schnitz. He went mental. Mate, he needs a schnitty. Smash the. Do they have schnitty over there? That's In why he's angry. There you go. He hasn't had Someone schnitties is... for a couple of weeks. He's been over in America. Mate, What's doing? Did him a schnitty. Um, went on a yeah. Just smashed the record. You know what? I, in some ways, I didn't mind it because like it, it proved a point to say. You know what? He's like he does care about his tennis. He does care. Oh. Mm. And he's got this Mate. little bit of exterior like oh, I, I don't care. Like I just I just I play tennis because I'm good at it. I don't care what I do. But he cares. He showed that that, that those actions show he cares. But I oh, went, holy I schnitz when he smashed it. The smithereens. Oh, crazy town. Crazy town. But <laughs> oh, I agree with you, mate. I agree with you. Like, okay, yeah, not the best look, whatever. But it shows you he cares. It's it's entertainment. It happens. No one got hurt. Enjoy it. Now, we're going to head to a break. Uh, they were our holy schnitz sporting moments, thanks to schnitz. Got that winning taste right now? Schnitz handcrafted schnitz. It was made fresh and made just for you. Welcome back to the Captain's Run with Cameron Smith. Now, we're going to go through our tips, Smithy. Who yes, we got? Mate. The Panthers versus the Eels. Who are you backing, mate? I'm going to go Penrith. I think wow. they'll get home, yep. A couple of rested players. Um, well, a couple, 13, but I think they'll get home. Champion side, Penrith. I think they'll win. Storm Raiders. Storm. Sharkies Cowboys. I think the Cows can upset wow. them and get Uh-oh. a prelim in Townsville. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Roosters, Rabbitohs to wrap it up. Uh, look, I think the Roosters will win again in a really tight match. This might be a golden pointer. 
And uh, thanks for listening, everyone. That's a season done and dusted. That's a season done and dusted. How good finals footy. We will be back next week, and you're going to want to listen to next week because it's a huge episode planned. See you next week.